Welcome to the Euston Designer Interview Series with Billy Blue College of Design at Torrens University. Today we're speaking with Barbara Hamilton from First Avenue Design. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you, John, and thank you for inviting me to chat. Well, thank you for sharing your story with us. And uh, uh, before we get into uh, what First Avenue is all about, where did Barbara Hamilton start in the industry? I think, John, I fell into the industry. I, at 15, I left school. Um, school and I didn't get along that well, and mainly because I was the, the person who was always asking why, and my school didn't respond particularly well to people who did that. So I left at 15, uh, started uh, working for a, high, for, for a couture company, a dressmaking company in Adelaide, that um, was high couture. And to put that in context, I guess, you know, I, in those days I was earning $18 an hour as a junior, and their gowns or dresses were approximately $2,000 a dress. So wow. you can understand the, the level that it was on. But what I did was I actually landed in a place where was, that was full of creatives where everybody spent all day asking why. And I think, and, and I also worked, I was lucky enough, this company uh, was run by, actually all women, uh, very strong women. In fact, I don't think there was a male who worked in the company. And the two directors were, were uh, female, really strong, strong characters, but also uh, really strong at design. So I spent my day surrounded by it, and that was in the days too where people drafted and drafting was you know akin to architecture in those days architecture for clothes and so if i think about it i have no doubt that having fallen into that place where everybody thought the same way i did and then being exposed to people who are really highly skilled at crafting that's where my design that's where it started yeah. Yeah. interesting we've spoken to a number of people during the series and it's amazing how many people actually have started from fashion and moved mm. into interiors. And equally, we're, we're speaking with some people that are strictly in fashion. But um, I guess it's a, creative, it's a creative space, so they go hand in hand, don't they? It, it is. So how did you, how did you then move or, or, or transfer into the interiors business? So from there, I moved into, I guess, a range of similar, uh, similar uh, jobs and interests and, and developed more and more a, a, well, a love of design. But also, I think, along the way, Different jobs that I took also taught me what part of design that I really enjoyed doing. And what I do like about design particularly is the analysis of design, the, the function of design, and, and what sits behind the creative design as well. And so eventually, having, um, having discovered what I really did like, then I ventured into design for myself. Yeah, yeah. Is, is there a particular style that you lean towards, or is there a particular designer that actually influences your style? I, I think there's a, you know, a, a famous mantra f that modernists use, which is form fo or ever follows function. And I guess that is my mantra too. I, I believe there's two elements to design, two, the two strongest elements to design. One is the form, one is, one is function basically. And function is every bit, it, it is more important actually even than the aesthetics of something. Um, and then the aesthetics is the layer on top of function that makes it look really beautiful and makes you enjoy that space and enhances it even further again um, visually, uh, with light, with space, with a whole other range of things. So I guess my, the way I always approach any job and the things that I hold most important in jobs are form and function. Mm -hmm. I know you, you specialise in residential and commercial and um, we'll get into some of those projects shortly, but uh, I guess what, what's your true speciality? I describe my job a lot of times is pulling buildings apart and putting them back together again. <laughs> Hopefully in a more functional and more aesthetically pleasing way. So, uh, so that, is, that is my specialty. I guess I have ended up uh, working over and over again on very large projects. So large rebuilds, large renovations where we literally strip buildings back to bare bones. I work with councils, go through all of that process. So it's usually a lengthy process and I'll be working with clients for, you know, one, two, two years, and then continuing on from there as later on I will revisit projects and we will add on to those projects. We'll do more extensions, we'll do landscaping, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I think when people discover how well they live in a space that's crafted for them, 
they, they buy into that and they're very committed then to continuing to make every part of their, their home, including the, the landscape, every part of where they live and the space they inhabit as, as personalised for them as they can. Yeah. Designers today tend to specialise in, particularly in education, in residential design or in commercial design. You've, you've covered both and you've been in the industry a long time. How easy is it to transition from one to the other? I think they, they're very different uh, and I think they have different sets of disciplines as well. So commercial, of course, is much more, um, ha has a lot more rigorous uh, compliance uh, around it, I guess. I mean, residential does as well and is always building compliance around residential design and development. Uh, commercial has a different level of, of, the, of compliance and typically people will do one or the other because you probably don't want to have to go through the process of learning what you need to do for, for each of those things. But So you can do both, of course, and there are many people who do do that. Typically there'll be maybe larger businesses who may have somebody in their business who specialises in the compliance surrounding commercial design mm. because it is, there, it is even, even in sourcing product, it is an entirely different process because every piece that you pick has to have a criteria of compliance before it has anything else. And so, so they're approached in two different ways. Yeah. We're such an international world these days with the internet and the access to information on a global mm. basis. Where do you see Australian design on a global basis today? How do we compare? I think Australian designs, I, I think Australian design is some of the best design in the world. I, I think our architects are, are incredible. We have some really talented designers. I think we have, we, we have a, a, a very unique approach to building, I think, in, in our country, and we haven't been perhaps as limited in architecture and design as some other countries who were, who are, where people are trying to mesh new design and new architecture into existing cities with almost no space to, to move. We began our design process, I guess, in our architecture process much later and, and you know, really in the last 100, 150 years. So I, I think we started from a different place, but we also have unique features in our country, lighting, the light in our country, for example, the space volume that we respond to and we, des we design, and architects in particular, I think, design. Uh, around those elements and it's a very successful, very successful way of designing. Yeah, sure. What's one of the success story that, um, success stories I should say that Barbara's been involved in? One of my favourite projects is a project I talk about often if I'm asked about projects is a, a, a very, it's the smallest project I've ever worked on and a project on the northern beaches of Sydney. And the house, which was over two levels, was 103 square metres, wow. so tiny. And the owners who were expats, and so living overseas, wanted this to be their holiday home. And so I had to turn 103 square metres into a place that could be leased out for holiday let, have three bedrooms, two bathrooms. Wow. <laughs> and um, I, actually, I've never played Tetris, but I understand the principles around Tetris. And it, it was literally trying to, it was using every single, every single thing that you know about the way design has to work and function has to work to, and garnering every bit of space there was for utility in that place. And so, for example, I added two levels of decking running out from the house, and each one of those was 90 square metres, but one sat above the other. So we had 90 square metres of shaded space, and we had 100, uh, 90 square metres of um, exposed, but with, with um, you know, with, with shading, with, with umbrellas. So we added 180 square metres of decking to a house that was 103 square metres. Yeah. But it was beautiful when it was finished, perfectly formed, function of it was was absolutely beautiful and and it was an old house built out of rubble literally built out of rubble um, and um, and and timber but it, so it was a it was an amazing result the clients could not believe the result that we got from, huge, huge from the space yeah. yeah there is a trend um, not just in Australia but globally for small space living and mm. in fact we're influenced by the European and the Asian mm. communities these days and in in, in, in a, from a spatial sense What's some of the? What's one of the secrets to, I guess, designing a small space interior? I think you you can have small space, and in fact, I quite like small space, particularly in floor space. But if you're going to be designing that, you need to have elevation. So you need to have high ceilings, 
and you need to have light and you need to have windows and you need to have those all of those things working so not just windows aren't just there to let in light but they have to be there they have to be placed for very specific reasons so a it tricks your eye into thinking that you're in a much larger volume of space than what you are and that all of the light is appropriate in the space as well for living. So I think that's the main secret, honestly, John, is to have a small floor plan is absolutely fine and you can work with that as long as you have volume somewhere and that volume needs to come from height. What's your opinion on colour in a small space? I think colour anywhere, even in a small space, is okay. And I look, and I don't use, I've got to say, I don't use a lot of colour in the work that I do. And uh, not for any particular reason, because the majority of people, to be honest, really don't respond so well to colour, but some people do, and colour can be used anywhere as long as it's balanced. It's, you cannot just have, for example, a white interior and have one red sofa that's saying, look at me, and nothing else in the room that's balanced with it. When you balance that with art, accessories, other pieces, and th then that becomes a neutral. And so for me, as long as you can employ colour, in a manner which it becomes a, a neutral, it, it's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, so. I mean, and, and colour is wonderful to use and it certainly has impact mm. when you use it the right way. Yes. Um, but the, I mean, the, the rule of thumb is that 80% is still neutral that, yes. that people use. Yes. Um, so um, clearly people are more comfortable with neutral tones. Yes. Barbara, what's, what's a mistake that um, Barbara may have made that we can learn from? Okay, I, like most people, John, have made my fair share of mistakes. I was very fortunate though, in, in my mid-twenties, I had a wonderful mentor who I worked for and I made a particularly bad mistake on, on a particular um, a, a specification that I had, had done, which possibly could, it didn't, but could have affected like, the printing of 10,000 metres of fabric for a textile mill. And I was absolutely devastated. And so we put in processes that made sure that that mistake wouldn't happen again. And that was a really good learning curve because it was about process and how you do deal with your mistakes. But he also said to me that everybody makes mistakes and the only people who don't make mistakes are people who never do anything or make a decision because that's the only way you can not make a mistake. Yeah. So the mistake wasn't made light of, but, but essentially the response to it was, okay, that's happened, let's work out how how you rectify that and how we make sure that doesn't happen again. And so that's what I've always employed in my own work. And so if I do make a mistake, I immediately set about making sure that there's a process to make sure that I don't do that same thing, whatever it is, yeah, again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Be accountable. And, and yes, at the end of the day, correct, you yes. learn by that. And, and, and also uh, and be honest forward. about it too. Yeah, and, yeah. and you're right, being accountable. So I also, you know, discovered a long time ago that clients are, are very responsive when you will go and say, I've made a mistake and we, this is what's the result of it and this is what's going to have to happen, mm. as opposed to pretending something didn't happen or, or trying to uh, be deceptive about it and, and not tell, tell somebody. Honestly, best approach, just yeah. be honest, put in a process to make sure it doesn't happen again sure. and move on. Yeah, yeah. Do you think as Australians we're influenced by any particular culture in design? Oh. I don't know that we were influenced by our heritage is, is English, obviously, and we have a lot of buildings that don't necessarily <laughs> don't necessarily suit our our environment as a result of that. I don't know that. Uh, in terms of influence, I think. Hmm. I guess the Hamptons has been very strong for the last, let's say, five years now, and it's still, it's still strong. The, 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 I guess the theme is changing, but the, yeah. the look just suits the Australian and, lifestyle. And, and so that, that is a particular cultural influence. You're right, yeah. it is. And I, and I was, when you were saying that, I was thinking to myself, and, and of course that is exactly why we, people have responded to that Hamptons look or that beach, you know, that sort of ca very casual uh, beach look, is because it does work with our properties here. You know, they are you know, on the coast, you know, with windows and light and air and, and ventilation and all of the things that work really well for our property. So, so that, is, that is something. I think also, I think Australians have, uh, for me, clients respond really well to a combination almost of deco and Japanese design. Mm -hmm. And it's because they're very simple design, they're, they're usually characterised by beautiful materials used in a really simple way. And I think there's very strong elements of that through the majority of particularly modern Australian design. Simplicity, beautiful materials, beautiful detail, not much clutter. Yeah, yeah, simple fine lines. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 
Tell me about First Avenue Design. Well, First Avenue Design is a, a business that I've, I, I guess I've reinvented my design business in the last couple of years. And First Avenue Design is a practice that's really set up to collaborate with other designers, to work with clients. And the, the purpose of that really is to be able to utilise the strengths of, of different designers and take the very best of what people can do and use it in appropriate projects. In fact, my, my experience talking to a lot of designers who have had really bad experiences with clients so for any design students or people seeking sort of some clarification on what happens when that happens, is my, my experience is that the majority of problems that people experience with clients in projects, and a lot of projects don't end well for designers or for clients, and so it's not a happy time for either of them, is because the wrong skills have been matched to the wrong project. Mm -hmm. and. Unfortunately, that's, uh, some of that also comes from the fact that a, a client might give a brief to a designer thinking that's what they need and the designer will take that brief thinking that's what the client will need and ultimately that, that, that project might morph into something that's much bigger than that, that, that they no longer have the skills for mm -hmm. and they don't ever revisit that. And so my business is really aimed at trying to take people with exactly the right skills for exactly the right projects, mm -hmm. matching them up so that everybody has a really good result. Look, Design, that makes, that makes total sense. Uh, it, it, total sense of the fact that um, just because you're labelled an interior designer, you have different specialities yes. and different things that you have expertise in. Mm. It might be colour, it might be space, it might be um, the, the, the actual design drawing side of things. Yes. It might be textiles, it might be window coverings. Yes. I mean, there are so many elements to being an interior designer. And it's the same with a business. I mean, you, you bring in your own you bring in your specialities sure, absolutely. to make your business. So yes, it makes perfect you sense. You do, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. And designers typically work alone. And I think we are heading into a day and age now where designers will no longer do that. Mm -hmm. They will collaborate with other people. They will work out what they like doing best, what they're strongest at doing. Mm -hmm. And then they will work with other people to take up parts of a project. Even if that project morphs into something else, rather than them say, okay, well, I can do all that. You know, they, they'll be telling people they collaborate and, sure. and that they will work with other people. Yeah, yeah. And, and, it's, it's, and I think it's really important that that's perhaps the way this industry continues to develop. That, that in itself is very innovative and um, certainly a way of moving forward um, with the design industry. Now tell me about the art projects you're involved with. Well, I, apart from reinventing my interior design business and um, I, have also, I have also more recently been heavily involved in a, a, an art or canvas art business that I have or an art, art business that I have. It's my great love, my great passion, all of my life I have, uh, yeah, it is one of the great joys of my life is, is art and artworks. And so I am lucky enough now to collaborate with some really wonderful, talented photographers, artists and um, curators and working on an art range, which is really in principle, it, it, is, it certainly is a retail range as well, but it's really being curated with artists, with, with architects and designers in mind. Uh, I, it's a, a group of people who've worked in the design business and know what designers are looking for for clients in terms of size, scale, colours, a whole range of things and the range is developed very specifically. Mm. To, to suit architects and designers. Another, another facet to the design yes, industry. Correct, yeah, another yes, Another element to it. Yeah. What advice would Barbara give to somebody who's listening to this, wanting to start out in the design industry today? If I was starting in the design industry today, things that I would like to know, I, I, I guess, would be, I, I think really importantly, do collaborate. Um, surround yourself with peers, people that you trust, Make sure that you're involved in groups that are uh, that are happy to uh, help to mentor you, to give you advice about things that you should and shouldn't do. Even things, for example, if I was in this industry now starting, I would belong. I belong now to um, only to a couple, but to two Facebook groups that are for interior designer uh, designers only. They're closed Facebook groups. One's in America and one is in Australia. They, 
Honestly, some days they are the thing that keeps me sane. When you've had a really bad day, it, it's a it's a great thing to be reminded that you know there's there's everybody has problems in their day that they need to fix and, and sort out as a designer. But but it's also there were great resources as well. So it is a group of people who if you need to know how to source anything you just you put it into the group and the next thing you've got an answer from five people who are very wise who've been doing this job for a really long time looking for products the same thing so so if I was going into this industry today starting out new find really good peer groups mm -hmm. c collaborate with other designers even through those through those groups and and also um, yeah, ju jump Network in. Network the industry. Ju yeah, yeah, yeah. but, but jump in because it's, a, it's an amazing industry mm. and it, it's, a, it's an opportunity to, to design and to create for people something that's the most, one of the most meaningful things that they will have in their life and that is a home that's crafted for them and, and speaks to them and works for them. So there's, yes, it, it's, a, it's an amazing, amazing industry. And You're creating somebody's personal space, aren't you? You are, absolutely. Yeah. And, and the very best that it can be for them. And many designers, sorry, many clients will never realise how important that is. In fact, I have, I have clients a lot afterwards who come back and will say to me, I had no idea how I know you talked about it, I know you explained how important it would be to have this space work for us, but we never understood how meaningful that would be until we lived in the space. Yeah, wow. So, and people can't know that either. So, so it's our job to make sure they understand. Sure. How do people contact Barbara Hamilton? They can contact me through First Avenue Design, through my website. They can contact me through Curious Art Bar, which is my art site. They so Curious Art Bar. Curious Art Bar. And First Avenue, First Design, Avenue Design is your website. Yes, correct. Yeah, lovely. Yeah. Thank you, Barbara, for spending time with us today. You're welcome. Thanks. Okay. I really enjoyed it, John. Thank you.